Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual Tom E. Moses Memorial Lecture on the U.S. Constitution. Uh, for those of you that I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, uh, my name is Jay Wyatt and I am the new Director of Programs and Research here at the Robert C. Byrd Center for Legislative Studies. I'll be your host this evening. Uh, for each of the past nine years, the Moses Memorial Lecture has brought esteemed speakers to the Byrd Center here on the campus of Shepherd University uh, to discuss contemporary constitutional issues and to help commemorate the delegates' final approval of the United States Constitution in Philadelphia on September 17, 1787, 226 years ago today. Senator Robert C. Byrd launched this lecture series in 2005, and subsequent speakers have included renowned law professors, historians, and policy analysts. Our speakers have come from differing backgrounds, and each offered up unique perspectives, arguments, and ideas about the Constitution. But the one common thread linking them was a core belief in the Constitution's central importance in the day-to-day -day lives of American people. Senator Byrd spoke to this during his inaugural speech. He said, not a day has passed in the history of this great republic in which the Constitution has not been important. These qualities, I think, would have endeared each of these speakers to the late Tom E. Moses, the man after which this memorial lecture has been named. A decorated World War II veteran and a devoted civil libertarian, Mr. Moses spent much of his life defending American civil liberties and the United States Constitution. He worked on fair housing and civil rights issues in Cleveland and Baltimore, and while living in Ohio, he started the first welfare rights organization in the United States. A longtime resident of Jefferson County, Mr. Moses founded the Eastern Panhandle Branch of the American Civil Liberties Union, West Virginia, and he served on its board. Governor J. Rockefeller appointed him to serve on the Potomac Center for Individuals with Disabilities, and the United Way of the Eastern Panhandle awarded him its prestigious Van Risen Award for his dedicated service. <clears throat> it is his family, his wife Naomi, and his three daughters, Lynn Moses, <clears throat> excuse me, Lynn Moses Yellett, Merle Crawford, and Jerry Moses Eichler, that has made this event a central part of our Constitution Day commemoration. Unfortunately, it is with sadness that we announced the death of Naomi Moses just two weeks ago. She was a great supporter of this lecture series, and she was very proud that one of the legacies of her husband's love of the Constitution and his social conscience is this annual forum. When Naomi was asked if she would like the lecture title to be changed to include her name, she declined so that it wouldn't take away from Tom's legacy as a champion of civil liberties. We here at the Bird Center express our sincerest condolences, as well as our appreciation for the contributions that Naomi made to the success of this event over the years. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Tonight's speaker is no stranger to these parts. Dr. Ray Smock has served as the director of the Robert C. Byrd Center for, Le for Legislative Studies since its opening in 2002. Ray was a consultant to the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, and he served as the historian for the House of Representatives from 1983 to 1994. He has frequently appeared on national radio and television programs to discuss American politics and constitutional issues including a few in the past couple days. Ray has written extensively on Congress and the Constitution. He is the author or editor of Masters of the House, Congressional Leadership Over Two Centuries, Landmark Documents of the U.S. Congress, and more recently, Congress Investigates a Critical and Documentary History. As House historian, his office res was responsible for numerous publications on the history of Congress, including the Biographical Directory of the United States Congress. He holds a PhD in American history from the University of Maryland College Park. And ladies and gentlemen, Ray is simply one of the most articulate and incisive scholars of Congress and the Constitution that I've had the pleasure of working with. Ray's, following Ray's lecture, we will open the floor for a question and answer period. We ask that anyone interested in asking a question please step forward to one of the two microphones in the front of the aisles. Following the question and answer period, we will adjourn to the lobby for the all-important light refreshments. So without further ado, please welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Ray Smock.
Thank you and welcome everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be the speaker this year. Uh, I'm not sure I qualify as distinguished compared to some of our other speakers, and I did not write Jay's line where he said that I was articulate. Um, I want to thank Jay in, uh, for his introduction and also welcome him uh, to our staff. And I too would like to express my condolences uh, to the Moses family who are here with us this evening. Uh, Naomi was a great friend of uh, this place and uh, she knew I was going to be the speaker this year so I, I passed muster in that regard because she always had a hand in selecting the annual uh, lecturer. Now, um, Senator Byrd always carried a pocket constitution with him wherever he went, and it's no longer necessary because those of you, and most of you have something like this, can now download constitution apps. At some, many of them at no charge. And just today, the United States government put out a Constitution app to end all Constitution apps. It's the United States Constitution annotated, complete with the full histories of all court cases, uh, detailed annotations about every part of the Constitution. And they just announced it today, so look for that app. You can also find it online. It's not yet available for Androids, for you Androids out there. Uh, and while I'm holding this up, please silence your cell phones if you have one with you. On a hot day in July 1974, President Nixon's personal team descended on the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. in a last-ditch effort to save the president from impeachment. They wanted to read the Constitution not just any copy of the Constitution, not the, any copy that you'd find in a high school textbook, anywhere you would look. They wanted to see the original four pages, the handwritten document that was signed by the signers, which is at the National Archives, where it's kept in a bomb-proof, debold safe, housed in a thick subterranean concrete vault said to be able to survive a nuclear attack on the nation's capital. Just what they were looking for was never made clear. Perhaps they were looking for a comma, <laughs> perhaps a dash, or some word, something on that original four pages that was missing in all the copies that had ever been made. They wanted to save Nixon from his terrible situation. They were searching for some elusive meaning that wasn't there. And that's the title of my talk tonight, Our Elusive Constitution. The very idea of the president's team descending on the National Archives to read the original uh, Constitution resonates with me. <clears throat> These four little pages, and some that have been added over the years, including the parts of the Bill of Rights, are this nation's touchstone to our civil order and how we conduct our civil government. The Constitution is written in straightforward language. Yet for its entire history, the Constitution has been subjected to various interpretations that make up the story of this nation's quest to understand its founding documents. It's a never-ending story. It's filled with countless books, journals, commentaries, editorials, court decisions, scholarly works, and hundreds of biographies of the framers of the Constitution. In 226 years, we have never completely reached consensus on what this plain language means. It remains elusive, just out of our grasp. As I began to write this talk, a number of current constitutional issues swirled around my head. They are all taken from today's newspaper. I don't have to go very far into the past. They're all taken from blogs and tweets and television programs today, from the left, from the right, from Republicans and Democrats, from progressives and Tea Party folks in a rather remarkable tower of confusion and concern about what all these issues mean to the survival of our republic. The Supreme Court recently overturned a portion of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, appalling many who had struggled so long to guarantee voting rights for African Americans. And then we saw the same court overturn the Defense of Marriage Act of 1996, 
thus allowing same-sex marriages to resume in California and other states. DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, was originally pushed by conservatives with the intention of declaring marriage to be an institution between a man and a woman. Republicans and Democrats both supported DOMA in large numbers 20 years ago. And now it's thrown out, declared unconstitutional by a conservative Supreme Court. As I was finishing the first draft of this talk, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg presided at a wedding between two men. As the nation commemorated the 50th anniversary of the 1963 March on Washington, that commemoration took on new urgency as it seemed the High Court had knocked the teeth out of the Voting Rights Act. No sooner was the ink dry on the court's de decision before uh, several states pushed forward legislation that would further restrict African Americans and others from voting. Some of these laws are now on the books. Others are being challenged in the court. As part of the commemoration of that 1963 march, just a few weeks ago, Time Magazine's cover for August 26 featured Martin Luther King with the title Founding Father which I thought was perfectly fitting as a tribute. And it raised in my mind the question, who else besides the founders of 1787 that we could call founders? Other in, uh, issues in my constitutional stew include President Obama's response to the use of chemical warfare in the Syrian Civil War. The president said, that he was ready to engage in limited military action in Syria because it was against international law to use such an indiscriminate weapon of mass destruction. And then the president seemed to retreat and said he would delay this action while he consulted with Congress, which those of us who are interested in the Constitution thought was a brilliant move, even though it certainly didn't look good in the newspapers. And this may set up a very interesting constitutional uh, conflict, conflict between the executive and uh, legislative uh, branches of Congress over war-making powers, uh, a discussion I welcome. Mixed with this breaking news about the, our intentions in Syria was the usual punditry and journalistic speculation about what Congress would do when it returned from its long recess to address the looming problem of extending the debt limit of the United States and possibly defaulting on the faith and credit of the entire nation. The media were speculating when this country might see again a regular appropriations bill that passes both houses of Congress and passes them in time in order to start a new fiscal year, which, which happens in October in two more weeks, if they were on time, which they're not. In the meantime, the sequester, <laughs> one of the worst examples of congressional appropriations process in any recent Congress, continues unabated. Unless it is repealed or revised, the sequester will last until the year 2022. Each year, arbitrarily cutting by percentages parts of the budget without serious review of whether or not those are wasteful parts of, the, of, of federal appropriations. Gridlock reigns in Congress with little or no legislative progress being made on any front other than the naming of post offices and 41 attempts to repeal the Affordable Health Care Act, known by friend and foe alike as Obamacare. And as frosting on this whirligig of constitutional issues, some far out members of Congress are calling for the president's impeachment. Although just for what, other than the fact that they don't like him, is not clear. Then there is a movement of sorts going on right now called uh, defund Obamacare. Some members of Congress, now up to 80 by the last count, have proposed, proposed defunding this law. And I would like to ask them how they plan to do that. Uh, how do you defund legislation that has passed both houses of Congress, been signed by the President of the United States, 
and declared constitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States. Defunding programs you don't like that have become law is, seems like it might be a good idea, but it certainly isn't in the Constitution or in any law book. Repealing the Affordable Health Care Act is the only constitutional way to defund it, and the chances of that are little or nil. So that remains a constitutional loggerhead. We'll see in a few weeks if uh, those in Congress who don't like Obamacare and some that don't like the whole federal budget uh, will uh, cause a crisis that results in the shutting down of the government. That would indeed be a major constitutional crisis. Stay tuned. So such is the state of our constitutional union as I speak to you tonight. In 1983, I was appointed historian of the U.S. House of Representatives by House Speaker Tip O'Neill. I was hired to develop a seven-year program uh, to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the Constitution, the uh, Congress, and the Bill of Rights. My education on how elusive the Constitution was, was just beginning. <coughs> Suddenly I was thrust into the interior world of the House of Representatives without any prior training or experience for such an assignment. I wondered how I even got the job. I knew the House wanted a professional historian to head the office, but you think they would have been able to find someone who had some idea of what the institution was like besides what I had learned in textbooks. It was years before I finally understood the simple fact that everybody who works for Congress or who serves there as an elected representative comes to that place as a babe in the woods. The true measure is what you make of your time while you are there. As I was coming out of my first meeting with the House leaders in Speaker Tip O'Neill's office, I encountered the chairman of the House Rules Committee 83-year-old Claude Pepper of Florida. Chairman Pepper reached out his hand to mine uh, to shake my hand, and then he clutched my hand in both of his and held on to me. He congratulated me on my appointment, and then he said he was sorry he had missed the meeting in the Speaker's office. He had been detained. Then he looked me straight in the eye, still holding on to my hand, and said, I have two questions for you, if you don't mind. And I said, uh, no, sir, I don't mind at all. And the first question he asked me is, do you believe in the Constitution of the United States of America? And I said, yes, sir, I do. And then he pulled me even closer, and he cocked his head a little bit, and he said, you're not a communist, are you? <laughs> and I said, no, sir, I'm not. And then he said, he let go of my hand finally, and he said, I think you'll do just fine. <laughs> what an entrance exam. It took me a while for it to sink in. When he asked me if I was a communist, he was making a joke about himself. Claude Pepper was in the United States Senate when Franklin Roosevelt was president. He was a big supporter of FDR and the New Deal, including that radical and controversial thing called Social Security. Pepper had lost his seat in the Senate in 1950 when I was just nine years old and one of, in one of the dirtiest campaigns ever. His opponent called him Red Pepper, and he was smeared as a communist because he supported these three things, Social Security, government funding for cancer research, and equal pay for women. He was way ahead of his time for Florida in 1950. And uh, it also, this was the time, uh, as Tom Noses would remember, since he fought this movement, when Joe McCarthy was beginning his smear campaign, uh, Joe, Senator Joe McCarthy of Wisconsin. So that ended uh, Pepper's career. And then in 1963, Senator Pepper, we always called him Senator Pepper or Chairman Pepper, Chairman Pepper. Uh, Senator Pepper came back to the House 
in 63, and he served there in the House of Representatives until, until he died in 1989. He was one of the truly great Americans that I had the pleasure of meeting in my tenure as House historian. Today, the House of Representatives and the Senate, according to all the polls, have the lowest rating of public approval since pollsters began keeping records. Less than 10% of the nation gives Congress a positive rating. What the polls don't say is that Congress has rarely had a positive rating. In 1927, House uh, Speaker Nicholas Longworth, a Republican who was quite a popular speaker, lamented the fact that Congress got terrible press and uh, even worse condemnation from the public. He said he looked into history. He saw that Congress was not popular when Henry Clay was Speaker. He saw that Congress was not popular when Abraham Lincoln served in the House of Representatives. And he said, I've learned to live with criticism and move on. When Congress reached its bicentennial in 1989, I was planning uh, the script, and I was writing the script for a joyous day of speeches and commemoration in the House chamber. And at the same time, House Speaker Jim Wright of Texas, who had succeeded Tip O'Neill, was just months away from resigning his office as Speaker. His was the latest scandal that had befallen the House. There would be subsequent scandals in the House, in the House post office involving members and officers and in the sergeant at arms office, where the House Bank, as it was called, often regularly allowed members to overdraw their accounts. Speaker Wright had been accused of House ethics violations relating to book royalties and other issues. A relatively new House member from Georgia, Newt Gingrich, was making a name for himself by attacking the House as a den of sin and corruption. Where was the Constitution in all of this? It was there all along, but quite elusive, and very much lost in the daily headlines of scandals and growing partisan bitterness. While I worked on my celebratory uh, script of upbeat speeches about the survival of our Constitution for two centuries, I hoped to demonstrate that Congress and the federal government was, as James Madison said, the greatest reflection on human nature. Yet scandals and partisanship were on the rise all around me. I wanted to celebrate the better angels of Congress and the government, while all around me they were trying to act like fallen angels. The corruption in the House was in part due to the fact that Democrats had held the House for 40 years. And uh, that was a long time, and that led to institutional uh, assumptions that led to corruption. But it was true that for more than 200 years, the House and the Senate had found ways to isolate and limit the effects of personal scandals and even institutional failures by reforming itself on a number of occasions. What was new in the 1980s and the 1990s was a growing hard-edged partisanship that took every transgression of rules and laws, whether real or imagined, and turned them into short-term political advantage for one party or the other. Members of opposite parties who had tr traditionally functioned as political adversaries during the day and drinking buddies at night suddenly became full-time enemies. In the midst of all this mess, it took a poet to clarify again for me and to remind me of the importance of Congress and the U.S. Constitution. The big event that I was planning was complete with the United States Army Band, the House Chamber decorated with bunting, fe featuring the unveiling of House postage stamps and uh, commemorative coins with the Postmaster General and the Secretary of the Treasury on the, po on the program, a keynote speech by the distinguished historian David McCullough, and uh, the presentation of the colors by the Joint Armed Forces Color Guard, accompanied by the 3rd Infantry, Fife and Drum Corps, the whole nine yards. This was a wonderful, beautiful, patriotic event. Looked great on television. C-SPAN still has an archive with it. But something was missing. I wanted this other element. And back in 1959, the great Lincoln scholar and 
poet Carl Sandburg had actually come to the house on the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's uh, birth. And it was the only time that a, a poet or a scholar like that uh, uh, had come to speak to the house chamber. So I wanted a poet. The poet laureate of the United States at the time was Howard Nemiroff of Washington University in St. Louis. He had been a fighter pilot in World War II who flew 100 missions. He got into the war early by joining the Royal Air Force before switching to the Army Air Force. He stayed a pilot throughout the war. There were still a lot of veterans of World War II in the House then, in 1989, including some of the leaders like uh, Senator Bob Dole, the <coughs> Senate leader at the time, House Republican leader Bob Michael, both decorated veterans, and the speaker, Jim Wright, himself a bombardier at B-24 Liberators in the Pacific, for which he received the Distinguished Flying Cross. I called Nemiroff at his home in St. Louis. I told him who I was and that I would like him to write a special poem that would uh, commemorate the 200th anniversary of Congress. Not only that, I said, I want you to come to Washington and read it before a joint meeting of Congress in front of a nationally televised audience. He said he'd think it over. <laughs> the next day, he called and said he would do it. So I had worked this script for this event over for months. Timing was critical. Members don't like it when it goes on too long. I had give, was given an hour and 45 minutes. They were going to come in at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we had to be out of there long before noon so that they could recess and start the afternoon session. So. I timed everything, went over and over it again, knew precisely what everyone was going to say, except the Poet Laureate. I'd given him no direction, no topic, no suggestion for content. Given all the scandals that were swirling around Congress at the time, I had no idea if he would say harsh things about Congress or not. The time came for the 79-year-old Poet Laureate reveal his creation. I stood at the podium near the House Parliamentarian where I could look out uh, and in, in, into the members' faces and also see the packed galleries up, up above. Nemiroff's legs shook. He seemed a little wobbly. But he clenched the lectern in both hands and read his poem. And this is what he said to the Congress that day. To the Congress of the United States entering its third century with preface, because reverence has never been America's thing, this verse in your honor will not begin, O thou, but rather the great respect our country has to give, may you all continue to deserve and have. Here at the fulcrum of us all, the feather of truth against the soul is weighed and had better be found to balance, lest our enterprise collapse in silence. For here the million varying wills get melted down and hammered out until the movies reduce to stills that tell us what the law is about. Conflict's endemic in the mind. Your job's to hear it in the wind and compass it in opposites and bring the antagonists by your wits to being one, and that the law thenceforth, until you change your minds against and with the shifting winds that is this, that this in that way blow the straw. So it's a republic, Franz Franklin said, if you can keep it. And we did, thus far, and hope to keep our quarrel funny and just, though with this moral, Praise without end for the go-ahead zeal of whoever it was invented the wheel, but never a word for the poor soul's sake who thought ahead and invented the break. <laughs> there were a few sentences of absolute silence after Nemiroff finished. He started to leave the podium. It was almost as if the politicians in the room in a political chamber, did not know how to respond to a poet. 
But then the place opened up into cheers and applause and appreciative laughter. Nemiroff went over and sat down next to David McCullough. And David told me later, Nemiroff said two words to him. It worked. <laughs> Historians and political scientists don't usually turn to poets for political insights or inspiration. I think we should do it more often. If government is the greatest of all reflections on human nature, as Madison said, then maybe our government officials need a larger dose of the humanities as part of their toolkit to be governors. And I would throw into that big toolkit a block of ethics, morality, and a concern not just for today's issues, but for posterity. The Constitution was front and center in Nemiroff's marvelous poem. It was not at all elusive, even though the word Constitution did not appear anywhere in the poem. What the poet expressed was a deep understanding of the Constitution. He also knew something so many members of Congress failed to see. Our whole government, our whole Constitution, our republic could, as he said, collapse in silence unless we make it work through compromise. The opening sentence of his poem just simply bowled me over. Here at the fulcrum of us all. When was the last time you thought of Congress as the fulcrum of our national life? the fulcrum of us all. A fulcrum is a balancing point, a defining point, a center of things. This is what the framers of the Constitution expected Congress to be. The poet described how fragile the process is. As a young fighter pilot, he saw how easy it was to destroy nations and political systems with weapons. And he saw, too, how nations could be destroyed by the lack of political will and by powerful, blinding ideologies. He said, the feather of the truth against the soul is weighed. What could be more elusive than the feather of truth? What is truth? We don't always know, but we better keep trying to find it. And in Congress, with two warring parties, claiming to hold the truth, we had better be able to find something that works, even if it isn't the elusive, absolute truth. And what is the soul? Another elusive thing. Without, but without what we call the soul, there is no nation. There is no civilization. The poet said Congress is the place where all of our wills get hammered out until we arrive at the law. This hammering out is called compromise, the art of politics. It is called problem solving. Only in a dictatorship does one party get its own way all the time. Conflict, the poet said, is an essential part of governing and something we can't do without, or we can't just wish it to go away. But we have to compass our conflicts in opposites. We have to frame our arguments and look for solutions. America's genius has always been pragmatic, problem-solving approach to government. Nemiroff's uh, whimsical end, I, I thought, was, was absolutely perfect. It was a, it's a signature of his poetry that he often deals with serious subjects with, and tempers it with humor or sometimes an ironic uh, uh, juxtaposition. Congress has this dual function of promoting change, of boldly going into the future with the zeal of whoever it was invented the wheel. But there are times when the role of Congress is to put on the brakes. Sometimes a do-nothing Congress is exactly what the public wants. But the question then becomes, how long can Congress fail to compromise? How long can the brakes be applied? before the House and the Senate lose their ability to play out their constitutional role of being governing partners with the President. I think it would be very hard to find anyone today who would call Congress our national fulcrum. But it should be. Congress is the branch closest to the people. 
It has all the powers it ever had under the Constitution to play a central role in policy making and governing. Yet for the last 60 years or more, that power has gravitated to the executive branch. We have come to think of presidents of the United States as the one person who can fulfill our national agenda and one person who can lead. That's an impossible dream, ladies and gentlemen. We can't put that on any president. <coughs> Congress has all but abdicated its power to declare war. Americans have died in foreign wars without a declaration of war. Congress has turned over enormous power to presidents, especially since 9-11 when Congress gave President George W. Bush and subsequently to President Barack Obama the power to wage war not only against other nations but against organizations and even individuals. That's in the Iraq Resolution of 2002 and that hasn't been repealed. They can go to war against an individual. That works nicely with our drones, doesn't it, don't you think? Senator Byrd, one of the 23 senators who voted against going to war in Iraq, wrote in his book, Losing America, and I quote, the awesome power to commit this nation to war must be taken back from the hands of a single individual, the President of the United States, and returned to the people's representatives in Congress as the framers intended. No president must ever again be granted such license with our troops and our treasure. We are discovering new revelations uh, daily of secret documents that describe the vast network of intelligence gathering that has grown up to protect us from future terrorist attacks. Just weeks ago, details of this intelligent network uh, emerged and we learned that it costs us taxpayers 50 billion dollars a year. We have learned that data collection of emails and other electronic communications of American citizens has gone on for a number of years in the name of keeping us safe from international terrorism. This raises serious questions about privacy uh, and uh, that are guaranteed privacy rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution. How much privacy are we willing to give up? Uh, I don't know the answer. I'm asking you. How much are we willing to give up to feel a bit safer from political terrorists? We are no longer living in the world the Constitution was drafted in, in which the world was draft, Constitution was drafted, so that I won't end with a preposition. That document must be the same, but uh, the, the document is the same, but the world is not the same. The Fourth Amendment guarantees people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. I can't read the minds of the founders, but I would have presumed that email is papers. And if my computer is in my home, does this mean that neither the government nor anyone else can seize or search my electronic effects? The most recent uh, campaign of the Supreme Court decision, or uh, the Supreme Court decision regarding campaign reform called Citizens United expands the idea that money is free speech. And the floodgates have been open, as you all know, for even more money than ever in our political campaigns. Well, I am less worried about the actual dollars spent on our elections than I am what happens to government when our presidents and our members of Congress have to spend way too much of their time fundraising instead of governing. That's the real tragedy of Citizens United. Money also fuels hyper-partisanship, and we certainly know we have that today. We are divided into warring camps, and both parties use the same marketing techniques to give us, get us to give them money. They try to frighten us to death every day that if we don't give them 10 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever we can give today, the other party is going to destroy, destroy America tomorrow. Uh, my email box is full of these, and I'm sure that you've all seen that kind of mail. Every day, both parties sends out millions of such messages designed to demonize the other party. 
So it's no wonder that we are at each other's throats politically at all times. The Constitution is not perfect. It never was. Some of its compromises made possible the creation of this modern republic like the world has never seen. The compromises made the United States possible. Yet some of those compromises regarding slavery led to bloody civil war, the loss of 750,000 American lives, and the echoes of that war, now 150 years old, are still deeply embedded in our politics and in our culture. The Constitution is not a thing to be worshipped as having been inspired by God as much as it is a document made by human beings with all the strengths and frailties our species has always had. In this regard, we are no different, no better, no worse than the men who launched our government and gave us a means to build a just nation and provide for our common defense, our domestic tranquility, and our general welfare. I reject the notion that the elusive answers to our constitutional questions lie only in the so-called original intent of the founders, because they didn't have all the answers then any more than we have all the answers now. They knew how fragile and elusive the very concept of government can be. And I have learned from sources as diverse as the Bible and the Federalist essays that humans are not perfect. The men who gave us our Constitution deserve our study, our respect, and our critical eye. They will always be a touchstone and a source of strength as long as this republic endures. But each generation of Americans has got to step up to the plate and become founders in various ways in our own time and for our future. The founders of 1787 could not imagine the world that we're living in today. Ours is still an experiment in self-government. We can't blindly hearken back to 1787 to learn how to make this country work. We need to be as inventive in our own time as the revolutionary generation was in their time. We must build on the shoulders of giants, but not expect them to carry us forever. I honor what past generations have done in war and peace to keep this republic alive. But I will conclude my remarks by asking you two questions. The first is, is America's greatness in the past? And are the generations alive now less likely to achieve greatness than was true of our forebearers? And the second question, which I have already mentioned, who are our founders today? Who are the men and women who will make this Constitution endure for another 226 years? We need uh, government, our, the government we have now does not need to be reinvented. The Constitution, the words of the Constitution still work but we need to get rid of the hardened ideology and work more toward the common good before those words can have meaning again. The founders of 1787 created and established a new kind of government that demonstrated that humans could be freed from past restraints on human freedom. The founders of the 21st century and beyond will have an even greater challenge. We the people of the 21st century must use government and all the resources of the private sector as well to create a new political, economic, moral, and ethical framework that gives us the freedom to think beyond our immediate concerns and to think pragmatically and globally about what we need to save the planet, among other things. Uh, that issue 
uh, goes way beyond our Constitution and affects even the nature of life on Earth. So when you look around and you don't find this new kind of founder anywhere, pick up the challenge yourself. Your country and this planet are depending on you. And I thank you very much. <laughs>